We got Randall Likens making his return back to the show. Tim Andrews making his first appearance. Uh, we've been out there just having fun and running dogs and doing what we like to do. So uh, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> I'll leave it up to y'all. I'll jump in wherever. <laughs> well, here's here's my, my thought of the day. I've been thinking about this for a couple of days. So I got the 11-week puppy at home right now with the and I got the two year old. And so, you know, there's all this discussion about dogs like pinning down running birds, right? Watching the two dogs play in the house, it's really obvious like what's going on. A lot more than out in the open field, right? Because you're running around the kitchen island or like the couch and all that kind of stuff. You can watch like when one starts to run away instead of just chasing, they're like calculating where are they gonna go and they'll run a different direction and cut them off. So I guess two part question. One, do you think there's a way to like foster that other than just like unstructured playtime? And then two, how much unstructured playtime is, is there, is there such thing as too much or is it okay? Just like, Hey, you got these dogs, like just let them have fun. Let them do whatever. Like, Hmm. is that good? I mean, on the first part, are you asking, is it, will that carry over into like pinning birds in the field later? Yeah. Oh, I would say that they're two totally separate things in that case. Um, I think that's just play. Just yeah. dogs being dogs, reading body language and pack structure and all the other things. So. You don't think that, like, they think about that, think about the bird doing the same thing when trying to anticipate movements and that kind of thing? Like, No, I mean, maybe, I mean, we don't, I can't read his brain, but I, I right. think those are two different things. I mean, stuff like that, I always go back to, like, we talk about associative learning with these dogs. What in that scenario would transfer over into the field with birds that by association that dog would possibly make that connection right like it may have some instinctual underlying things chemically in its brain doing the same thing but as far as like what's triggering that what's causing that i'm gonna say that like it's it, you know unless you come up yeah. with something that is very like black and white it's here and it's also going to be out there i don't mm. think the dog's gonna connect those two well because you're taking one that's emphasizing and focused on pack structure and building pack structure and maintaining it and another one that's prey and those are two totally different drives so yeah. I, you know i'm not saying that something like the agility of them learning how to cut and turn and uh, yeah that'll transfer but uh, as far as the drives being separate i mean they're separate so. And in regards to the second part and the unstructured play, I am an advocate of let the dogs figure it out. The more we try and inject ourselves and control how they interact, how often they play, how rough they play, how gentle they play, like it just seems to kind of muddy the waters up and you start kind of creating some, I don't know, maybe anxiety in one dog. And then it, you, you start bringing some unnatural tendencies between them when you're trying to control it to that degree. So mm-hmm. If you are concerned, and I, I'd like to get your take on this, if you're concerned with too much play, that's when you go put one or both of them up in the kennel. And instead of trying to control the actual play that they're doing inside in the moment, just if, if you don't like that, prevent it from happening in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yep. I I was just thinking from a, like a develop. So, you know, I had the one dog. She didn't get the play time. Mm-hmm. Now... Now she's playing with the puppy like constantly. The puppy can't be around the like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> so I just just thinking about like the difference between the two and like you know is it, is it going to be a, like does the puppy need is it does the puppy need a lot of alone time too? Yes. To like yep. and so when does it become too much to like? So I I'm not not from the perspective of like you know they're tearing my heart apart. I get that like I can <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. just from the like hey the puppy needs to like some alone time to figure things out on her own. You know, how much is, how much is too much? It's a balance, right? Like they, they need that alone time with us. They need that alone time in their kennel. Like the, the I keep telling my clients now is like kennel time is therapy time for mm-hmm. them. That's where they go to get their reset. Just like we would go sit in a hot tub or, or whatever is your thing. Um, as far as like unstructured play, I do it. Um, but everybody's wearing an e-collar so I can make sure that if it does go too far, I'm not letting them sort it out. I'm I'm sorting it out with them. Because mm-hmm. um, I've seen a lot of a good number of dog fights and, and helped a couple people that had some dogs that were like, it started out as rough play. It started out as too much fun. Someone took it too far and someone took it personally. And then it ended up in these two dogs that literally can't see each other mm-hmm. or they will 
chew through the drywall to get to each other. So there's a limit. Um, I like to do it after they're satisfied drive wise. So we go do a bunch of retrieves, a bunch of field work, you name it. And then we go do our fun run and that's when they can romp and play and, you know, push each other. And if I catch one dog being too pushy then you know, he gets put up or separated or I'll give some corrections with the collar or something like that. But they need some of that so they can establish that pack structure and, and mm-hmm. do that stuff. But you can certainly go too far, too too quick. So, I think that applies to everything. I think it was the episode I did with Ethan a few weeks ago. I think he said, you know, everything. Less is more on everything. Yeah. And moderation is is the key word in balance. And, you know, I mean, you, both your puppy and older ones have been out here and we've done fun runs. And it's like your puppy was perfect to wear when it was on the tie out, sleeping, just chill. And as soon as it was time to go romp and play and be a puppy and dog, that light switch turned on. And then as soon as you got back to the truck, that dog was like asleep in your arms before you even put him up. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that that's how it's supposed to go is, is when you get the dog out for an activity, it should be all about it. Like if your dog, we get the puppies and so many people just want to let the puppies, you know, they even hear us set, talk about it. Let a puppy be a puppy. Like, mm-hmm you still have to set those boundaries in the structure, but I believe in the less time out, the better with, especially with a young Mm -hmm. puppy. What do you think that the dog's going to figure out or get into more chances than not? It's just going to learn bad habits. And I also, I want, when I go engage with my puppy and we're doing some food training, earning your dinner or whatever, like they are excited to be out of the crate and kennel. Like they are all about me and uh, then, of course, when you build up, you know, consistency, the dog starts learning its place within the pack, within the home, potty training. That's when it starts gaining more uh, freedom, mm-hmm. if you will. They have to earn their freedom. I'm not a fan of just get a puppy home and it's like, oh, free run of the house because, you know, eventually that is the end goal. Mm-hmm. Curb it down because I'm sorry, those puppies... I think the vast majority of people out there with puppies overstimulate their puppies Mm -hmm. and, and just getting that dog comfortable to shut off his brain inside a kennel or crate or a dog on top of a dog bed. I I think that's one of the most valuable things that, that somebody for getting their first puppy or a new puppy. And maybe that it's been a while since they've done it is like, man, just err on the side of less is more Mm -hmm. with them. Cat does a really good job. Actually. She's, she's done a couple little shorts or reels or videos on, on puppies and, and how she allows them to play and unsupervised play and stuff like that. So she, she does a good job on that, but you know, I'm, I'm picking up a puppy too in a, in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to have another little one and uh, you know, time in the box is beneficial for them. Mm-hmm. And when you come out, there's a purpose that might just be going to go potty, but that's the purpose. Yeah. You know, so like when I get them out, there's a reason why they're coming out. And there are some of those like little puppy fun walks and go explore. And yes, you do need to meet the other dogs and, but there's a purpose. There's a reason why you're coming out. And then we go back to the, to the crate and settle down and get their therapy time in and stuff like that. So yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's important to work it in, especially that free, free play with the other dogs in the pack. Once everybody's introduced, let them start figuring out each other and where each one stands because that's part of the socialization we talk about puppies have to learn how to interact with other dogs and it's not even so much from an aggression standpoint it's just like some dogs just grow up and they're like two or three and they're the most awkward things because they've (laughs) never been around other dogs they've never been allowed to play and just you know, you have the helicopter parents with, with their kids. You have the, you know, I would say it's even worse with dogs a lot of the time <laughs> nowadays. It's, uh, you know, you have to let let them get through their awkward teenage years uh, because then they don't know how to play. We've all seen the older mm-hmm. dog that it's just like, oh, it's time to play. And they're just like, I, I don't know what this is. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Either that or they're just steamrolling all the other dogs. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. They don't know how to play them. appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the stuff we've done today and what, what we've seen because we've kind of had a nice wide range of dogs. For experience level, what we're working on, I mean, we have literally kind of run the gambit of 
what we've been working on to where you're preparing for you your eh, if I can talk your utility test next weekend. I'm force fetching Quinn, but I'm taking advantage of the fact that I had a couple extra hands and somebody to gun. So I did a little bit of steadiness with Quinn, Lucy hand handle uh, some handling on retrieves and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then we got Lily out, and we're still just building that that love of pigeons. Uh, that that's that's kind of a work in progress. And then the younger dogs, we've we've done it all. So like, what what was y'all's takes? Thinking back on today before we came inside to. To, to beat that pending hurricane that you brought with you. Uh, what stands out to you in regards to what we've been working with the dogs today? I'm going to start with the, the not sexy stuff, right? Like um, that little wire hair puppy I had, you know, just doing a bird intro with her. She wasn't super interested, even though I'm trying to play some, some prey games with her and keeping that bird on a string and keeping it, you know, a dead bird, but very young dog and trying to en entice that and keep those games going. But she really wasn't interested. And that's fine. She doesn't know the game yet, right? So that's where we will use that kennel and that crate time, and we'll we'll build that game. You know, you you want to come out of the box to purpose play this game, and then be satisfied, a bunch of love, and all the hugs and kisses for a little puppy, and then back in the crate to settle down and wash her and repeat. We're gonna keep doing that. So she's got some promise. She didn't show me anything that I thought you know was a deal breaker. So. She was certainly interested in the quail. Yeah, I mean, uh, but, you know, like, I stopped early. I didn't really get yeah. what people would expect. You know, they want to see a dog hammering that bird and chasing and all that stuff, and it's just some of this stuff, you got to move on their timelines, and we can use some games and tricks to tease it out, but for the most part, man. Well, and it's not even so much maybe it's not the timeline or her age. It could be that she's on the road yep. in a foreign place, foreign people, foreign dogs, completely different setup to where she literally walked around the corner and there's a giant chicken coop yeah. with chickens there and she that blew her mind and then you walk right past the pigeon coop and then there you're in the middle of the obedience uh, obstacle course and we had all the dead quail shot from the runs before it that she went over there and smelled there was a lot of new environmental and, factors yes man. to where it may be to where like all right we try it again later tomorrow yeah. morning she's she's ready to go on it because she had showed a little interest i mean she's yeah. a wire hair. she's gonna be interested but it may not even be the age factor and i think that's what a lot of people need to start factoring in is is it's not a black and white thing it, it's i think you're out here a couple of weeks ago tim and and we saw something out of lily and and it, it wasn't good or bad but i remember i told you i'm like file that away like just in case this we start noticing a pattern file it away what was different about this setup what you know how was the scent moving because then it's when that dog starts showing the certain behaviors time and time again and you don't start filing those away that's when it takes people two years to figure out something that the dog's been telling them you know it, that they should have caught like a year and a half earlier mm -hmm. yeah I mean, they're constantly watching us and watching our body language and reading us, and they're keeping score all the time. I mean, we got to do the same thing. Right. And watch them and keep that catalog of, of behaviors and, and see what we need to, which direction we need to go. So, yeah. The th what about you, Tim? What stood out to you? Well, I've been thinking a lot here in the last <laughs> 30 minutes or so about, like, I think that I'm probably what, drive capping, right? Would that be the appropriate, like, mm -hmm. and, to my detriment or to Lily's detriment, I guess. So like, that's the only, that, you know, seeing some of the things that we saw today, like, and you've seen from, from her before Nick, but, um, but I see him as being atypical for like my experience with her. Like it has to be like, we're just doing things. I'm doing things differently down here. It's, it's got to be something that I'm doing. Cause so, and it's probably is the coming harder with the obedience stuff, that long heel walk, like, it's well, just let's give the context for for everybody listening because everybody listening they weren't out there that's today, true. yeah right yeah. so let's talk about I, we all know exactly what where we're going on this because we had a nice long discussion on it and and plan what ifs and problem solving and troubleshooting if you will talk to me talk to everybody tell everybody like what what behavior you saw today and like why it was concerning and then then we can kind of go down the path of the drive capping situation because we're going to let old Randall go into some drive management discussion on that. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot every time. I'll give you a couple minutes. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, I mean, if, for for some background, Lily is almost two, and I took very much to heart the you know let a puppy be a puppy thing. So like I very much tried to be all gas no breaks, mm -hmm. and then you know now post hunting season I'm trying to put put the brakes on it a little bit, and I think I've uh, probably gone a little too hard. And from the perspective of like today, we had coming into the field, it was a I don't know 150 yard like walk at heel, which she like takes for a lot of correction, which that's already been like I mean I've only. I didn't even start working with, with heel until three or four months ago. Like again, all gas, no brakes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it takes a lot of, it's take a lot of energy on my part to get her to do it. And you pointed out some other things too, with the heel specifically, which, uh, we'll put into place. But, uh, so then when she's released in the field, she just doesn't, I mean, she probably acts like you would expect a griff to, which, so you're probably like, Tim, yeah, whatever. Like, <laughs> but, but she's not getting, she's not ranging very far. She's not moving very fast. She doesn't seem all that interested, which is like totally atypical for her. Like she is a hard charger. She'll, I mean, in the short grass prairie, she was ranging out 200, 300 yards. You know, I mean, she's chasing like crazy. Like in the Northwoods, it was like, I mean, she got out to like half a mile. I'm like, hey, like we need to bring this in a little bit because I don't know where you're at anymore. So, I mean, it's just like, which is totally not the dog you guys saw today. Yeah. And so I think it has to just be like, she's, I put too much on her and too, and now she's like, this isn't fun anymore. And, you know, I mean, like that's kind of my perspective, my takeaway from like what we talked about today. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I've seen, I've seen her hunt out here before. I haven't seen the consistency that you've talked about, but like you coming down here, you know, when you're coming down here, you're like, well, what are we going to work on studying? Like we start talking about how we're going to go about handling the, the setups and everything. And it was like right out of the gate. Like you said, it's, it's uh, okay. Well, if, if she's hunting exactly how you want, she's searching and hitting objectives. The field search is exactly where you want. And then that's when you start putting requirements on it. You start putting, you start capping, the drives right but if the dog's not ready for it and then I, this is what randall's probably about to go go into is like how do you really start figuring out when that dog is in drive when when to start capping the drive because you said it best and i've gotten a lot of feedback from your episode and this is why i'm throwing it your way is so many people get out there and do exactly what you did to where i want my dog to heal to the line and we have a nice clean send off but what they're doing is they are really just killing that dog's motivation to where they're not even thinking about in the field. Like she, when you released her today, she Almost did not go. She didn't even care <laughs> to go because she was so consumed with the heel work. Right. It's not that she didn't, doesn't have any desire to go hunt just in that moment after a 150, 200 yard walk of getting corrected and, and, and heel work. The last thing on her mind is like, okay, now let's go. Mm -hmm. like, that, that's that's the opposite. So when you release stereos, it's kind of like a a dud firecracker, and you're like, oh, okay. And then it's like, you know, after a few birds, she kind of loosened back up a little bit. But it wasn't until afterwards we started thinking it. You're like, it's it's just here. It's just the field. And I'm like, well, what else is different? What do you do here that you don't do in the other fields? And you're like, there it is, the the heel. So that's probably it. Uh, but yeah, drive management, it's a tough conversation to have with a lot of people because you go to a training day, you see people with these nice, obedient dogs on, you know, standing nice at heel at, whoa, you want to get there. And the vast majority of people in this space are going to tell you, well, if you want to do that, start, start right now, start at the truck. And yes, if that's your goal for that session or, they've already been fulfilled in the field, right? Like it, th there's a lot of context here that I think people need to start kind of wrapping up the big picture. Don't just immediately like, Oh, my dog's going to be at my side all day for an hour. And then we're going to go do a clean field session. It's probably not going to go great. No. And I mean, just to the heel specifically, cause there's so much with this, discussion in that scenario now that's going through my brain but just for the heel specifically like i'm not going to ask a dog to do that if they can't heal on lead and i'm not going to ask a dog to heal 
towards something that they're really desiring and there's a whole lot of drive in here if I don't have a really clean on lead heel somewhere else because it's like I talked to you out there was watching you heal her from the truck up to us where we're trying you know getting ready to go run the course um, you know I noticed all the corrections I could see her getting corrected getting corrected getting corrected and I saw her get confused she no longer understood or, okay am I being corrected for walking am I being corrected for sitting at heel which which one is the correction right and that's why I talked to you about you know, when we're healing off leash, like the corrections are coming while we're moving, we're going to keep moving. Um, so that confusion right there can create anxiety to the collar, right? So avoiding some of that, and we're, we're going to, we'll go work in the garage, and I'll show you some of those techniques and tricks that we can use for that. Um, and positive reinforcement, that's where we put our money in the bank for this so that we can start doing those other things. Um, but I think that she got confused, got a little anxious, got a little worried, right? And then when you go to send her off, she's like, well, I'm, am I getting corrected for moving or am I getting corrected for sitting here? I don't understand. I'm getting nicked all over. So I'm, I'm very precise about these things when I'm looking for something I want to do. Like take Clyde, for example, right? I didn't expect that dog to heal with me, mm -hmm. right? All I asked for him to do before he got to go hunt was come heal one time stationary by my side and I'll release you. We start adding these obedience things, and this is where you get that poppy, flashy, with a purpose obedience, is they're in drive, they want to go, right? But I'm going to ask you for one thing, and I'm going to mark you, and we're going to go, right? I'm going to use that marker to tell you that you did the right thing in time and space, and then allow you whatever it is you're desiring at the moment. Um, and that's what we did with Clyde. You know, I, I need to clean up some of that stuff with him. Fine. Do this one thing, you get what you want. And then you saw with Creek out in the field, you know, how many times did I woe him, down him, recall him, heal him in between birds and ask him to do those certain things and immediately mark and release, right? That's where we start getting some of those popular, showier obedience things. And there's some pressures that go in there and we can, that's another rabbit hole. You know, there are times to use low pressure and like where I'm at right now. I'm on higher levels. It is it is do it and do it with a purpose and do it now. Um, you know, and that, that comes after years of repetitions and having pay history and reinforcement history. And I have so much money in the bank with those things. I can take these withdrawals and be okay to get that flashier obedience. Um, and, you know, this is one of many techniques. So you got to find the one that suits a dog. But I would definitely, you know, let's – work on what we came to work on and not worry about the rest of it. You mm -hmm. know, you saw that little puppy just drag me all over the place today. <laughs> drag me around. Okay. And then we worked on the one thing and then we went back. So just picking and choosing your battles is the most important part. So I hope that covered it yeah, all it did, yeah. thoroughly. You know, there's so much with that, that dog and what we can talk about. I'm getting it all wrapped up now, but hopefully that covers well, it. Well, drive management is literally, yeah. it's an hours long topic. Like mm -hmm. at some point, like I'm, we're figuring out the, the right guess in, yeah. in episode to, to do the subject justice. Mm -hmm. But I think what's important for people to, to realize, like you said, a number of things in there to where work on the things that, that you're working on now. Not every session can be all encompassing. Right. It's like I told you before we went out with Lily, like if you know for a fact that we have created this standard that that, that is now the expectation, you don't let them slip below that. But if you can't be working 10 different things at the same exact time. Right. So pick your battle. Are you going out in the field to work a good solid field search? Well, then you don't want to suppress them before you release them, right? You just want them to want to go out and, and find the birds. That is different than steadiness. That is different than retrieving. That is different than come go with me, right? But at each, every time you're in the field, and I think this is what confuses a lot of people, is like, yeah, but like we can't, if they mess up, then we have to correct them, right? Only on the stuff that you know is the standard because if it's not the standard then you're just watering down and muddying up the water on the stuff that you're actually trying to touch on in the field that that specific session or day 
right? And I think that's what confuses a lot of people is they think that they have to go out there and they have to have the perfect clean obedience before starting. Then they have to have the dog ranging and hunting and, and stretching the field. And then they require steadiness. Then they require the clean retrieve. Well, I mean, you've seen me out there with the dogs to where like the way I'm, I'm teaching field and stuff, sometimes that's not the most attractive field search, but you know what? I've built that up into her. I've put enough money into the bank. I've built that monster to where I know I can put this check cord on her and she's going to start seeing ghosts and birds popping up everywhere. Cause we've done so much stop to flush and it has meaning that to an outsider watching how sucked in she is when you put that check cord on her, they're gonna be like, oh man, that's not good. But then you take the check cord off and what does she do? She hauls ass. <laughs> she just can go find that bird, right? And that's I think that's where it's like when when we talk about focus on what you're out, actually out there to do, it, that still doesn't mean that you let the standards elsewhere fall down, but that is not the time to worry about other things. If you want good, clean obedience, before going out in the field, the time is not to do that before you go in the field. That's in the short grass. And that's kind of what he was talking about earlier. Like there is a time and a place to get that clean obedience and it's not right here right now. Yeah. Well, it's setting your training scenarios up or in sessions up so that we are only working on that one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are, there are days with the dogs where I go out and they're retrieving. Okay, sure. And, and I have a standard, but I'm after something else. That's what I'm worried on. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And if I don't get a good mark, they don't get a good retreat, whatever, I'm not going to fret about it because I got what I came for. There are also other days where I go out there for what I came for. And, you know, it just happens. Any trainer that says that every session goes perfect is not telling the truth. Right? <laughs> right. They don't always go perfect, man. But you got to find the silver lining in there somewhere and say, hey, at least I got this. We made progress here. We got these things I need to fix my setup or my scenario or go back and do some other training um, and come back to this subject. But look at all the other good stuff I did, you know, the dog did. And uh, we were talking about that with Quinn, right? Didn't she did a couple things I thought out there. Um, uh, force fetch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She got a couple really good off the table, collar reinforcement, pick the bird up, you know, you dropped it, pick it up again. Hey man, take that win right yeah, there. Like, get out of there. Yeah. And that, that's the value of having training partners that know exactly what you're after. Is like yesterday, you know, we haven't really shared the field that much. We've talked dog training more than we've actually gotten to train together. But I told him before we went out there with Quinn, I'm like, hey, don't let this turn into a retrieving lesson from me. I'm going out there to where uh, she offers full steadiness on pigeons. When you put quail or chucker down, guess what she doesn't do? <laughs> she doesn't want to give the, the full steadiness. So I'm trying to generalize and bridge that behavior that she gives me on pigeons over to the game birds while I have extra hands here to shoot birds, right? And But for the past couple months, I've been doing hold and force fetch with her. So that's kind of where my mind's been at, been at with her. I'm just taking advantage of that I've extra hands here today and so me knowing where my head is with Quinn now I told him don't let me veer off course here because it would be very easy for all of a sudden we're shooting birds I'm going to start requiring or enforcing something that's not fair to her yet and it didn't happen yesterday but then today what what he was talking about is we got two good clean like really good retrieve lessons built up into the, all of the other lessons in there but it was still at her level it was exactly what i knew that you could actually require of her it wasn't i'm not i'm not pushing her through the field to go get a bird she didn't mark right it's stuff like that to where it's just you you have to know where your dog's at and what's fair to require of it at, in that any given moment but you also got the other things that you were after steadiness wise yes so you could go now and focus on the other things right if i'm not getting what i want in this category i'm not going to go over here and fret about this well we're not shooting the bird if she didn't give us the other stuff i mean look at clyde yesterday right like you started to hand me the launcher remote and i was like no no 
I, <laughs> I I want you to do this. I want the dog to see a different person's timing, a different person's take on the bird coming up. You know, I think that uh, I I'll give you credit. I think you're a little more wild on the flushes than I am. Um, I'm I'm super wild. <laughs> yeah, hey, man, and that's a good thing, right? That's a that's something I catch myself doing from time to time where I'm like, get on point, get on point, get on point. And then I have to pop the bird instead of being like, nope, nope, pop it, you know, and truly recreating that wild scenario. So that's, that's the, uh, pigeons, (laughs) quails. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yep. Yeah. Eight eight bucks a piece. Eight bucks a piece. (laughs) piece, I got to make my training count. I got to make it count. But I mean, that's, let's talk about the timing on that because that's, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to get that timing right to when I I tell everybody like the, the best advice I can give everybody is err on launching the bird too soon because then you're out nothing, right? If you give that dog too much leeway, too much of an opportunity, that window is too big and you're just sitting there like, "Ah, he may have hit the sin on that one, but I don't know. I'm going to give him a chance. Now, if you think that he hit sin already, you should have launched already Mm -hmm. because what that he could potentially learn if you're wrong and you miss that change of behavior is more detrimental than if you just launch the bird and you're out, you know, five bucks on a, on a quail or, you know, a a homing pigeon. Okay. Well, we'll go, go get another pigeon to where we kind of had a cluster run with, with your dog Creek yesterday with planning the quail. We're doing loose birds. We're getting ready for the utility test, stuff like that. We put them down hard. Or so we thought. <laughs> Two out of the three were gone. Uh, it's easy to get frustrated on stuff like that, but at the end of the day, nothing bad was learned. At the end of the day, he's just out running, having a conditioning run. It only matters to us, and it eats us up because we know the dog doesn't know. It, it smells that there was a bird here at one point. Like he found where the birds were at one point. <laughs> But, you know, that's why I, I plant my birds super light. And then if you give me that launcher remote, unless you tell me air on on the side of the dog didn't smell it until it's, you know, the mouth is on the launcher, I'm launching that bird. I'm super flighty with that because to me, the, the potential bad lesson for that dog, I, I would rather just do away with the bird and not have that that hiccup of that dog learning like, Oh, I smelled the bird, but I can ignore that and get a little closer. I mean, that's what we talked about with, with Lily, right. And proprioception and odor thresholds and things like that. And that's why we kind of did that little scent wall drill with a check cord of, she has at some point been rewarded, self-rewarded, right? Not obviously you didn't reward this behavior, but she's been self-rewarded for getting close to the bird. And whether that's the chase or a catch or whatever, somewhere in there she got rewarded for that and that's why she continues to do it and now we're go back and limit her options and specifically put her in those scenarios and remind her of the odor threshold when you smell it even from this little bit this far away it's stop and then we'll reward you um and then we talked about you know rate of reinforcement needs to be high so they can pair and chain all this together but um yeah, I think that's a good. I, w- I want you to use that ten dollar word for the ten cent brain again. <laughs> Which one? Herpio perception. Proprioception. Proprioception. Yeah. Proprioception. All right. Let, let's let's define that. Let's put some meaning uh, behind that. Just putting it in in like average dog turning terms without going into like crazy. But it's the dog's perception of where they are, stimulus is, and we are at the same time. So we can become a part of that picture, right? So the dog can learn, okay, I smell bird, but dad's nowhere near me. So I don't stop. Okay, never mind. Dad's here. I stop. You know, and we see this with detection dogs more than anything in my experience. Um, but it, it is real. That's why you get that dog that when you call them back and they swing by the bird and they lock up immediately, right? No questions asked. They're solid. Then they're out there at 200 yards, they smell bird, and they dive right in. It, that can be part of that proprioception thing where dad is not in the picture, so the picture is not complete for me to complete mm. the behavior. Um, and that's, again, a theory, but it, it can be part of it. So Now, you were, earlier you are talking about it in the sense of distance 
and 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 how strong the odor is in that odor threshold. So, it, the yeah, the odor spatial situation to where like okay, that dog smells the bird, but it knows I'm not on top of the bird. I can get a little closer. So mm-hmm. that stuff that falls in the same same equation. Right. Um, so odor threshold would, would be that issue. And then, you know, you go back to like what you and Stephanie talked about with dopamine spiking at anticipation, yeah. right? They're on point. Well, what are they anticipating? And that dopamine's coming up and they're getting excited and they're, it's tempting for them to break. Yeah. So it is super common for a bird, a bird dog to start creeping forward and self reward. That's what we're ultimately always trying to protect ourselves and the dogs from is self rewarding on the bird so if we can limit that option and go back and show the dog the correct odor threshold odor picture you know that's why i chose that section of the field it was nice and clean the wind was coming from one direction we put the birds in certain spots that your grass is um you know set up where it could tunnel that odor very firmly a certain direction and that we could get those good changes of behavior to work the launcher and mark good behavior or punish bad behavior so mm. that was uh that was that was all about so the scent wall let's go, let's go down that because you you just ran through it real quick with tim because we we're already out there we've already had this discussion but i want to slow down i want to back back up let's describe the scent wall mm-hmm. why you wanted to do that how we actually set it up and the actual benefits thereof yeah so I just call it the scent wall. There may be, I'm sure someone else is doing this out there. I'm not the only one doing this. Yeah. I'm sure they call it something else, but you know, in the detection world, we have a wall and they can range in size from one sheet of plywood to I've seen whole 200 foot long ones. Right. With just a bunch of PVC, yeah, a bunch of PVC holes in there. And in some of them, there's distractor odors, you know, a piece of a bite suit, uh, dog urine, dog food, uh, dead rodent, you name it, a tennis ball. There's a distractor odor in there, but in one of those, there will be the target odor, which pick your target odor. Quail. Yeah, quail. (laughs) I've I've thought about it, but remember, we talked about odor threshold, so we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, We did not build a wall with a bunch of PVC elbows in the field, if anybody's there. We're getting there. So anyway, with that, you know, you can teach a dog a lot of good stuff on that, but the name of the game is to get off the wall decently quick so you can get out into the real world, real environmentals, and and start searching real things. But you come back to the wall a good bit because you get a lot of reps. You can get that rate of reinforcement up there high. You can correct some of those naughty behaviors of a dog proprioception dad walked behind me, I'm going to turn and anticipate reward. So we can work on some of those things in this pretty neutral environment where I can get a lot of reps very quickly. All right. And the only thing I'm changing is just moving where the odor is. And sometimes it will just stay stationary. So what I do is I pick up something like a road. I want a good barrier, something very physical. The dog can see, I can see, I know I'm moving crosswind and it keeps me on a path so I don't get off course. If I have to, I'll put flags in a line. That way I, I know I'm going perpendicular to the wind. And I'm putting those birds at 10 to 15 yards upwind of the dog, right? And I'm going to give them a minute to bake and sit there and cook and, and get some good odor out, you know, not too much. I don't want them sitting there for an hour, but 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So I know that the dog will be able to smell them. That's the key part. We can change the distance later. We can change how long they've been in there later. But at first, I want to make sure I'm getting that good odor contact. And I like to put a dog on a check cord around their waist um, and walk them down along that path. And as soon as I see that change, that head snap, a sniff, a look, anything, the bird's coming up. Well, guess what? I have another bird in 10 more yards and another bird in 10 more yards and another bird in 10 more yards. So I can get that correction, correction, correction. You did it right. And you saw her on the last one. She locked up and stayed steady for 15, 20 seconds. Right. And now, now I am working steadiness. Are you going to stand there and let, when you move a paw, the bird comes up so we can start working some other things with this too. And I use this again when I'm starting to teach a dog to be steady to the handler going in and flushing. You know, I like to have a helper and we will let the dog establish point. They're already establishing point and have the helper come in. And at first it's just get into the visual 
range of the dog. And then we're going to use our marker. So yes, okay, click, whatever you want to use. But I'm going to tell that dog you did the right thing right there. So as soon as I'm hitting that launcher remote, yes, the bird's coming up, bang, I shoot bird. And the dog gets rewarded. So you're marking, oh, sorry, so you're marking as you're launching the bird? Yep. Okay, because yep. that's to... signifying the end of the behavior, right? So right. Then, okay. A marker marks and terminates behavior in time and space. So we can talk to the dog at the speed of sound and tell them they did the right thing. So I'm using that marker, but I also need the bird to get up because once I say the marker, the dog's free. They can do anything that happens after the marker doesn't matter. So I'm putting those together, right? And eventually the bird is the marker. But So I'm using that marker, bird comes up, we shoot it. And then slowly, instead of being 15 yards off the bird, now we're 10. Now we're 8. Now we're 5. Now I'm standing on the bird. Now I might give a light kick. Now I might give two kicks. And you just slowly build that out and use your marker to tell the dog when they did the right thing, the behavior's terminated, and we'll, we'll shoot the bird. And when you say closing distance, you're talking your closing distance. The dog is still staying at The dog is still staying there. Or whatever. Yep, my, my helper or myself is still holding the leash. Um, I like a good 30-foot leash for this because, uh, again, proprioception. I don't want the dog to think that I have to be standing right over you for you to do this behavior i want you to know that you know, regardless of where i am and distance wise ignore that focus on odor and but yes the the spatial pressure part of this is the flusher coming in to the handler or whoever coming in to flush the bird that's the spatial pressure when you start seeing dogs get on point and you start creeping in on the bird and they start creeping in on the bird that's spatial pressure and that's what's causing them to do that break that's why i try to be very deliberate when I go up and flush a bird. Um, I don't do the whole creepy, like, oh, take a little rabbit step here, <laughs> a little rabbit step. You know, I just and go on wild and birds, it. you're not doing that not anyway. anyway. Yep. You're you're going in like the bird owes you money, and, <laughs> you, you know, then they're going to surprise you, and you're going to miss. That's how it works. <laughs> and I think the key with this man is, like, this does harken back to some of the other training methods um, and uh, – other ways to do this. I think that the trick with what I'm doing here is I'm getting off of this very quickly. Like we talked about, Yeah. I'm trying to get the behavior established and get it known and reinforceable. And I'm getting off of this very fast. I don't want to be do. I want to get the dog back off leash downwind, but I want to teach you right first, like point old point. Then we'll go off leash. We'll run them downwind and give them the chance now to make their mistake. Cause now they know that if they do the right thing, a bird will get shot. So now when I pop that bird and it flies, it has more meaning. That negative punishment has way more meaning. And if you if you don't have a helper, you can still do this solo. Yep. Obviously with a helper holding the dog with the with the back tie would be ideal, but it's it's interesting how everything comes full circle here as I actually had a listener write in the other day. But he uh Reminded me of something that I forgot in Craig Doherty's Building a Grouse Dog book is back tying the dog to a tree. So he would plant his bird in accordance to what the direction that the wind's going. And he's going to bring that dog in in that correction or in that direction. And when that dog goes on point, exactly where he walks them into and he's controlling the scenario, he uses that tree to back tie the dog to, and then he can go do that. So don't think that if you don't have a helper, you don't have a whole lot of land, you can't do this. This, this goes back to if you get some pigeons or just some good quality, dependable flyaway birds that, you know, y'all don't mind having quail or chucker run around the neighborhood for a couple of days. Uh, you can do this in your backyard and you can get those, the, the high rate of, uh, of reinforcement. And I think that's the main thing that you need to realize on this. So you aren't going up into a full on, scenario or field setup to where you're covering five plus acres with three birds the idea of this is a lot of reps very fast in a very confined area to where it's just like okay you're coming off the chain gang you're coming out of the truck whatever you're going out there it's boom rep 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 back on the chain back in the truck and yep. it's that high rate of reinforcement and and i think a lot of people don't even realize that you can play with your reinforcers in a lot of different ways rate is one of them but your variable the degree of payment mm -hmm. that matters the timing all of this stuff goes into it but the the rate you know you get a dog that's unenthusiastic to go into a field you do this a few times 
worst case scenario, say it doesn't even fully translate to you flushing a bird, it gets that dog back to being excited to go into the field, right? Is it the most attractive training? Again, no, but training is not always sexy, right? It doesn't always look good. And uh, I think a lot, you know, I, I fell into that camp too, to where like I, I bought into the whole notion a couple years ago, like, you know, check cores. I don't, I don't need check core. I don't need, I don't need this. And then once, once you start, there's a reason why some of these elements are common, common threads between so many methods. Right. And, and I think that a lot of people need to get, get comfortable with some of the things that have made them uncomfortable in the past <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and start realizing that there's new approaches and, and, and foreign concepts out there that, that can help them in a number of different ways. And that this right here, you set this up at a training scenario, you're going to get a lot of people looking sideways at it. But what just happened with Lily, we got the staunchest point out of that fourth bird and that, that fence or, or not, I, I call it the fence, the, the wall, uh, fourth bird, boom, slammed it staunch point all the way until we decided Randall decided to launch the bird. She didn't decide it. It wasn't launched as almost a correction, right? It was, you held this long enough. I'm going to give you the reward. Well, even think when I launched that bird, it was because I added spatial pressure. Yeah. I took a couple steps and that's when we started getting this, that pressure and that's when she decided to break. So that's a good sign for me. I mm -hmm. like to see that. Um, you know, the key with this is like, I'm big on isolating a behavior as, as far down as I can isolate it. Mm -hmm. I will worry about the hunt. That's its own thing. Mm -hmm. I will worry about that in its own setup here. I'm worried about something else. So I like to isolate what I'm truly after and like I, you know, Jay says it all the time is where I got it from, but, um, you know, control the outcome, isolate that behavior and work on that one thing. That's how we avoid having to correct all the other stuff because I've isolated it down to just this. And, uh, you know, this is a process for me, it, you know, it is a, a long-term process. It's something that we're going to, it takes time. You know, if you're good at it and you're, you're versed in the, in the, verbiage of it and everything then you can get it done faster and you can do it without a helper like i do it with a belly collar by myself um you know and there's some isms in there about oh well you know the birds or the dog's getting stimulus and bird odor and things like that and that's fine if your timing is correct um then they you can't afford to do that and you've got the payment history in the back where we can take those small deposit or withdrawals out of the bank so there are some other ways to go about it if you're by yourself. Mm. What do you, I mean, what did you think about watching that unfold? Like, did it, did it make sense while it was happening or did it, did you have to wait until afterwards when it was like, you actually could see it to understand it? It definitely made sense. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's so that like the repetition part of it, just, well, one, I mean, who doesn't want to like repeat things and like, like if you're trying to, I mean, just from the most basic level, like I'm going to try to get good something, good at something. I'm not going to do it and then like wait a year to come back to it. Like I want to do it again and again and again. It makes sense with the dog too. So to see that set up a scenario where she just gets to go bam, 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 you know, and like, yeah, it did make sense. And it, it, yeah. If I could have 10 launchers out there, right. I would have walked her down 10, yeah. 10 launchers, <laughs> you know, and then probably tomorrow I would have done one or two and cut her off leash Yeah, and, and, you know see what happens if we're not good yet cool we go back and i'll we'll keep working on it that's fine mm -hmm. you know but if i'm seeing everything i like then yeah yeah, yeah we'll move forward and guys you know that doesn't mean go line up 10 launchers and do it you know 10 do days it. in a row <laughs> do it <laughs> do it do let it, it rip <laughs> send it <laughs> but it, another thing i appreciated about that drill was it took away the opportunity to muddy the waters up. You mm -hmm. know, what we were talking about full circle where, you know, beforehand we we're doing the healing and that kind of capped her right out of the gate. Well, then we started getting a little momentum. We shot the bird. Well, then what happened on that retrieve? All of a sudden you're, you're saying heal, recalling, you know, you, you, there's like five or six commands all within the same thing. And what did she end up doing? She just got frustrated and essentially just dropped it at your feet and laid down. Right. Mm -hmm. That type of drill allowed you to work on what we perceived that needed to be worked on, which is her 
finding an establishing point without even the opportunity for the handler to get involved and jack it all up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's like it, isolation mm-hmm. is this is the actual behavior. I don't care about any of that other stuff. And, uh, you know, it it takes a lot because, I mean, it, I think a lot of people listening to this would fall in line. I know I did one years ago when I first started of doing exactly what you just did. Okay, well, we shot the bird now dog's got it but she's mouthing oh she dropped it up oh, she's not coming to me uh, you, you know and then you just start repeat. it's like a it's like a free fall like out of control <laughs> yeah. like i mean because she knows the right answer. i mean she knows like she will retrieve like i mean it's so, it's so that's the then you get into that weird like now we're in like a, a bad a t- just a terrible place i'm like yeah. I'm, i want to create this behavior but we're just like it just and i think <laughs> i messed up too like i should have asked you some questions first um you know, like, is your dog force fetched? Mm-hmm. What method did you use? How long ago was that? Have Have you had success afterwards? Or are you seeing regression? Like, I should have asked some of those questions. Um, you know, when I'm do- if I were running her as a client dog, right? I would be working on what I'm working on because you can't do anything if they don't establish point. That's right. step one. But when I did shoot those birds, it would have been puppy party. I'd have been throwing my hat in the air, excited, backing up, all excited, giddy. Bring the bird somewhat back. Dude, if you don't bring it all the way back, fine. Now, if you're force-fetched, that now we're a little different. Now we, can, I will reinforce this. This is a behavior I'm after. Depending on her um, attitude, if she's super sullen about the bird hunt and mm-hmm. the pointing and the things like that, which she wasn't. But, you know, if I would see that, then, okay, yeah, maybe I'm not going to worry about that. But she was fine, so I would have mm-hmm. then, you know, having been through a formal force fetch program, I would have reinforced that. But Mm -hmm. otherwise I try, like he said, I try to just pick one behavior Mm -hmm. and the rest of them will, will piece it all together. Too many people, in my opinion, because I've, I've talked to a good bit of folks now, which I, you to thank for that. Um, you know, had a lot of phone calls and a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And the theme that I'm seeing is that we jump to training the whole hunt right off the bat instead of breaking it down these little bitty digestible pieces and instead we're focused on doing the whole thing all at once so i think breaking them up and, and chunking them up is a better idea and then we'll we'll chunk them all together mm-hmm. at the end the other thing too whether it was intentional or not just because it's been so long since she's had a, a lead on her belly she was just very like mm-hmm cautious so like it made the whole thing more controlled like she wasn't running around like crazy which yeah. she didn't really do today anyways but normally i would have totally expect her to like you know, it's pretty you... atypical as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> so from the handler's perspective the person holding the leash you know i thought she had a responded well to the leash i mean mm-hmm. she only had one time where she was like what is that and then she just mm-hmm. went right back to focus but she was giving me some pressure on the leash mm-hmm. which at this point is okay because mm-hmm. i'm not using this for whoa right now i'm something different um, all right take me to where you think the bird is right, know, right i'm just limiting your option with this thing that's mm-hmm. all i'm doing um and i you can go to the neck i tend to not if i don't have to just so that they can swing and get get odor where they can get it so i do prefer the the belly for that but you know she was pulling me which is fine for what we were doing I want to, unless you had something else that you wanted to explore with, with him while y'all are on that topic, I want to talk markers before we wrap this up and the importance of, and this is another thing, just like the drive management to where there's so much within this subject and topic that it warrants a, its own episode uh, and much deeper dive. But the value of markers, because I think you hear marker now and people's heads automatically go to the pet smart trainer with a clicker and, and treats in his pocket, right? And this is something to where like I really prioritize and prize silent training and, and all of that, but the value of the markers with the correct timing and consistency, it's you can't really negate that. And, uh, so I want you to talk a little bit on markers. Like what is a marker? You, you gave the definition a minute ago, but let's expand on that to where people listening to this understand that it's more than just a clicker. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got plenty of different, I've, I've heard of people using e collar stem as a marker, right? Um, a marker marks and terminates a behavior in time and space at the speed of sound. 
that's or if you're using a collar you know speed that electricity will travel or that frequency will travel so the cool thing about this is i can tell the dog that they did the right thing in that moment and now to build duration out into a behavior i simply add time in between completing the behavior and when i deliver the mark so it, everything is reinforceable until the mark after the mark you they cannot be held accountable unless it's egregious like you know if i told my dog to go to place he gets on place and i mark him you know if he wants to run up the wall do a backflip and then rip out the extension cord on the wall like have at it man cool <laughs> i'm still going to pay you now if you want to run over and like nuke grandma walking down the street like no okay not 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 good right but poor grandma your marker is super super powerful cuz we can tell them exactly when we are terminating the behavior and add that duration right we can get a lot of uh, early success in training and teaching those minute or young dog pick your behavior you know you can get a lot of those baby step reps and build on those very very quickly based on that also you know when i hear a lot of people say oh my dog will only work for when i have a ball in my hand they'll only do it when i have a treat in my hand the power of the marker is the dog's working for the mark after the mark, then I will reach to produce a reward, right? So think detection, right? Back to my, my background here is telling the dog to go search that scent wall, right? And let's just say we're on a six-foot leash, or we could be off leash. It doesn't matter. I'm having him search that wall, and when he indicates on odor, you know, I will choose when he comes off of it. I'm building obedience to that odor. You stay with it until I terminate the behavior, so I can reinforce that, pick your method to reinforce it. Once that mark is delivered, you know, in the early stages, a mark is a promise. You know, I hate saying that because the pet world is taking that too far. But <laughs> in the early stages, the mark is a promise. If I mark you, I'm going to pay you. Uh, as we start going further and further and further along in training, the marker still marks and terminates behaviors, but we'll go to a variable reward system where now I'm paying you every three reps, every five, every ten pick your random number. I'm going to mix them all up. And that's how we addict dogs to behaviors. Um, you know, like the dogs that leave my program or they will not, not get on a place board. They're going to go get on it because we've addicted them to it through a variable marker reward system. Um, and that whole Stephanie talked about this in length, yeah. so I won't beat it up, but you know, the, the marker is super, super powerful and you can have a positive marker a duration marker and a negative marker. So the positive one means you did the right thing. Reward is coming. A duration marker means continue doing that behavior. So I use good, you know, dog gets on place and I'm trying to continue building duration. I can remain silent and some dogs I do. Other dogs need a little encouragement to continue doing that. So I'll give them that duration marker. Good, good. Just keep doing what you're doing. And then I will terminally mark them and pay them. Right. The negative marker is simply telling them that the behavior that they're offering will not result in reward. If I have to say no, no, any louder than I just said it, it's coming with a correction, right? You're going to get corrected. But that, you know, say I'm asking the dog to heal and they down, right? No, no. That's all it takes. And, the you know, over time, as we go through the system, the dogs learn, oh, no, no means this isn't what's going to get me paid right now. I need to perform tasks that dad said to get paid. And, you know, you're using negative and positive reinforcement with all of this also, but that's another way to communicate to the dog that they're doing the right thing, not doing the right thing, you know? So yeah, terminal marker marks and ends behavior, duration marker continues positive and negative. So, but super powerful system. If you're, if you're not using markers, you're, you're behind, um, in my opinion. So well, I would, I would probably argue that even if someone doesn't think they're using markers, they probably are like who doesn't communicate to their dog that they did the thing that they wanted, yeah. whether they think of it in terms of like, this is the marker. Like, I mean, they may be really inconsistent therefore. And not I was about well, to but say like, the, the, more <laughs> the question mark then goes with consistency, but then also the reason why it works and it holds value and what he referred to as addicts and the slot machine reference is it's the anticipation. And this goes back to Pavlov and classical conditioning without the anticipation, then it's that marker is not going to mean anything. So if you have a dog that 
really likes treats or kibble, that's its reward or whatever. If you are handing the dog the kibble and you mark it as you're handing the reward, there's no benefit into that. Mm -hmm. You need that mark and then you need that, that moment in time of, am I getting it? Am I getting it? There it is. All right. He's reaching in the pocket, right? You have to have that level of anticipation for that dopamine kick for in the dog's brain for it to matter. And, and, uh, once you start realizing that, that's why the variability thing goes in. It's like you tell them and they're anticipating it, but, oh, I didn't get it this time. Well, maybe the next time I do it faster. Because I know after all of the reps, after all of the times I've jumped on this place board and I've gotten paid, and he has used that marker, I've gotten paid, I know that it, it it's something I didn't do right. Maybe I go faster. Maybe I stay here longer. <laughs> Maybe I anticipate it. Maybe I offer it. Whatever. The dogs start trying to problem solve to get paid. And that's what when you know folks like Randall talk about the operant dog, that's what we're talking about is the problem solving dog. And you start being variable with it. And we suck as, as human beings. We suck at randomizing anything. And so if you think that every time you pay them, well, yeah, I mean, it's going to have some sort of value to that dog, but then you start taking it away. And then it's every five times, every 10 times, every 15 times. In the case of a slot machine, it's every thousand times that a jackpot hits. But why is it fun to sit there and pull that lever over and over and over again? Because anticipation, man. Anticipation. We know the outcome of what could happen mm -hmm. and we could get paid. It's the same concept with dogs. So, And you said it just now before I forget, but jackpot. Yeah. Dude, there are times where I go train these dogs and they get marked and marked and marked and asked to do behavior after behavior after behavior. And they, when I start seeing that, like, not neurotic, but get, getting close to the frustration of like, what else? How fast? Like, how much poppier do I have to do this? Like, ugh, you know, kind of get, when's it coming? Mm -hmm. And I will dump a whole bowl of food on the ground. They won the Corvette. They pulled the, <laughs> they pulled the lever. They won the Corvette. You know, Griswold's uh, unhappy that his son won a Corvette without him knowing, you know, the whole Lampoon's thing. But <laughs> uh, they that really spikes something with them. And they they work harder they're mm -hmm. more incentivized and we're playing off of that dopamine and that you know addiction mm -hmm. process but man there i will vary also how much reward i am giving maybe one time or maybe this time it's one piece of kibble maybe a handful nothing oh you got the whole bowl and they're like oh my god i i, I don't know which one's going to be the one but i'm just going to keep doing what dad asked me mm -hmm. to do because i know it's coming so so then do you do you do it, anything to intentionally associate that marker with the reward? Like I think Ethan and Kat talk about it as like charging the clicker. Charge right? your clicker. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, well, when you're starting out on anything, yeah, if, if you're brand new, you got your puppy, mm -hmm. and you're trying to build up this association with this click, with this verbal, with this whatever, with this handstand. Every time your dog does good, you do a handstand. Like it, for that to have meaning, you have to charge it. You have mm -hmm. to create that association. And that's why you just sit, sit there. And that's why a clicker is so easy. It takes – the emotion out of it, it takes the volume, the tone, all of it. It is consistent. No matter what you do, you can bang on that clicker as <laughs> much click. as <laughs> a, you can angry click. Uh, but it, it's the consistency that matters. And so for you to do that, you're doing it every time that you build the meaning. And then every time you're trying to teach this dog is mark, pay, mark, pay, mark, pay, 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 pay. Then it's every other one. Then you start taking it back every fifth one, whatever. And it, and it just naturally builds off of itself. I'm curious in regards to corrections though, if you have the, the, the bad marker do for it to remain a value to the dog, for it to have meaning to the dog, should we, every time we use the negative marker, like you have your fooey that, that is your end of the world marker. Mm -hmm. The dog hears it, you know, once every so often. When you say that, do you have to back that up every single time for that to hold the value in it? Because, you know, a lot of dogs, you take too long out in the field. We were talking about this the other day. Certain clients, you give a dog back. They know exactly what to do. 
but then, you know, they just haven't had the opportunity to go work the dog. So the dog hasn't been in the field for a year, right? It still has the knowledge back there, but it's almost like they don't care as much to make the mistakes because it's like the correction or the the punishment, if you will. I don't like using that word with, with the quadrants. Yeah. <laughs> but if if you if you make the correction it still has to hold meaning or else it's just like, why, why avoid it in the first place? Right. It has to be something worth avoiding. Yeah. I mean, now you're talking about like pressure avoidance and avoiding correction. And that is definitely a, a part of the process in opera conditioning. Like you do get to that point and there are again, people that break that down far better than me and we're getting you towards that person, <laughs> right? We're, we're working on getting you towards that guy and I don't want to out him yet. Cause I want, I really want that to be a good episode. So, just know it's coming. Um, but yeah, you, you, he's my booking agent. Yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've got to have that avoidance of pressure once you get through negative reinforcement into positive punishment. Right. And we start with those, you know, punishment level stimulus or correction to achieve the behavior we're after. Right. And then eventually the dog should learn if I do as asked, I avoid the pressure. Right. So. That is part of it. Um. So sim- so similarly to the association of the the reward, the reward and the the marker, the positive marker or whatever. Do you also like intentionally create that association? So like initially, every time you provide oh. a negative marker, are you providing the correction as well? Or do you well? make that no. variable over time as well? No, never very uh, corrections aren't variable. Right, a That's correction where I was is a correction. At. A correct, you will always get a correction if you've earned a correction. Um, you know if. Within reason, right? Like you can build anxiety that way mm-hmm. if yeah. you're overly correcting. Um, but yeah, my corrections are, are pretty timely and, and every time. What I was thinking about was the negative marker, right? And are we pairing the correction to the negative marker? No, right? I am doing that in obedience usually style things. And I'm just simply withholding reward. You know, I, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm just a vending machine. Yeah. yeah I'm, not, I'm not a dog trainer. I'm a vending machine. Right. You, dog, need to do what is asked to turn on vending machine. And the vending machine's telling you, hey, man, it's broken. Air code 100. Like, <laughs> it's not working. So Try again. Yeah. Try another number. That's what that negative marker is used for. I'm just simply not going to produce yeah. reward until you do the right thing. And as soon as you do, I'm marking you with your positive terminal marker and paying you. Now, with my others, like, nay fooey things like that those are big punishments there it, it's a great yeah Buckle if i up. if i'm if i'm yelling fooey at you it's <laughs> what it, did you yeah, do <laughs> <it's coming. laughs> um, but like i said you know i'm at that point in training and proofing for this test that punishments are big i'm not tolerating yeah. anything uh rewards are also big oh right out of the gates yesterday you know, we, we were headed to the line, and he was having a sloppy heel, mm-hmm. and you gave him a fooey just for the sloppy heel, and yeah. you would have thought that, like, he was like, oh, man. And then he realized that, like, the world's not com- coming crumbling down, but he had a very clean heel the rest of the mm-hmm. <laughs> 100 yards before we got to the start. <laughs> well, wasn't even, I mean, he had a nice heel, and then he got to that one point, and he, he got six inches ahead of me. Well, and, and, Hey, fooey, here it comes. Get back here. And let's move on. But the, I try not to make a big deal out of it. At the end of the day, corrections have to have consequences. Mm-hmm. And, th- and that's where I was going at is, you know, the dogs learn that all, all of a sudden if you give them the verbal correction or the marker and nothing comes of it, well, then that ceases to have meaning to the dog. But I also think in terms of reward, we're also not just talking about food. Nope. The reward can be, we talk about different drives in dogs. You, me and you were talking about this. Your young puppy doesn't seem to care about food mm-hmm. right now. Well, what does it care about? Does it care about a specific toy? Like, can you get it to care about a Kong, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that is a very valuable thing. Some dogs, just the reward, like Quinn's biggest reward, I can reward that dog in five, six different ways. The biggest one is she will lo- just, she will just suck in pigeon scent. Y'all have seen it. To, <laughs> y'all have seen it to where through that obstacle course and me just like she lives for that to where she can have the world's like most intense force fetch session on that table 
and I will release her, and that tail immediately goes right back up, and she's on that barrel waiting for me to crap out a bird. Yeah. <laughs> it's And so that's what you know. I was telling you, like, okay, your dog doesn't care about kibbles or treats. Would it make it easier? Sure, in in some ways, shape or form, but more than likely, yeah, kibble. That's it's nice. It's an easy go to. It's very very clean. Well, let's get it to care about the Kong. Let's get it to care about something else that is high value reward, so that the dog starts learning how to get paid. And I think a lot of people that, you know, I'm not the biggest food trainer. I use it, especially for young puppies. But like right now, if I'm going out there in the field with a pou- pouch of kibble and, and a <laughs> and a clicker right now, we're really hitting reset on something. I screwed something <laughs> yeah. up. Like <laughs> I'm not carrying around a pocket of kibble by any means, but it's just important as it goes back to recognizing what makes your dog tick. Well, I mean, I use food a lot. And even on bird dogs, like I teach woe with food. Yeah. That's how I teach. It's an obedience task. Yeah. That's what it is. It just means stop, stand there. So I teach it with food. Um, not that I'm, I'm also not carrying food out in the field. Right. That's not what I'm doing. I get to a point in the, the driveway, the short grass, wherever, pick your place, neutral environment, low stimulus environment. And I'm getting to a point where I can now call or reinforce these things. And then I will go out into the field and, work on it out there and now my reward is usually a dead bird or a tug or a ball something like that i'll change to something like that but uh, you can get a lot of progress out of stuff like that you know doing those shaping exercises shaping and naming and, and starting to reinforce some behaviors elsewhere and then bring it all out and i'm still using my marker with all that too so so then what about so we talked about the positive marker, we talked about the negative marker, but what about the duration marker? How do you build that? Like, cause I mean, there's certainly, I've seen dogs that like you say, you get the, they come on the place border and you say, good. They're like, Ooh, done. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Right. Classical yeah. conditioning. I mean, it just takes time. Right. Um, I like, you got to have a method of reinforcement. So leash or e-call or what, wherever you're at. But you know, if that word does start to make them break, reinforce them back on good, do your right thing. I may come over and flood a little bit with some food, meaning I'm just like pay, 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 reissue command, good, and leave them there. So there's some like massaging to all this. You know, it's it's definitely not a step by step by step by step process. Uh, you got to understand the concepts and then well, apply them. And, and also, it's this might be a very oversimplified way, but essentially, what are we doing? We're trying to overlay the the real marker which is to get food we've already built up that establishment so if you're trying to get the duration marker well let's just give that and then the correct the 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 finished good payment marker right so like if you're if your payment marker is good right and you want to establish yes as your duration just start classical conditioning yes good and then yes, good, yes, good, and then mm-hmm. start just doing away with the good, right? Like duration to where then it's yes, wait a while, then good, yes, wait a while, then good, and then yes, yeah. You see what I'm, mm-hmm. and then you're just building it up. It's just it's the same way that you overlay anything on that. It's just in the order that you do it, and are you consistent enough, and is your timing good enough? Yeah. And you, you used yes and good opposite how I, I use them. So now I'm like sitting here re- jocking my brain like, no, that's, no, you're that's doing not wrong. right. And I had to listen and be like, no, that is right. Okay, yes. <laughs> you switched them on me. But yeah, I mean, again, I'm fairly silent when I'm training. Um, I'm going to at first get the dog on there. and We're just going to add duration and then use my positive terminal marker before I start adding my duration marker. Right. I got to give them the right, give them the answers to the test, and then we'll start adding this because mm-hmm. I'll use that somewhere else. So I, I want that. I need that. But I'm going to give you the answers to the test first, mm-hmm. and then we'll teach you this, and then that's going to go apply elsewhere. But man, you can get so much work done so quickly. Keep your dog so happy to give them such a clear mind with proper negative reinforcement and still f- striving to positively reinforce while using your markers and if you can do that you're you can make a lot of money i mean i did it with steadiness i've done it with retrieving i've done it with tracking i've done it you know it it all applies so it gets different it's a a little different in each one but you know uh jay is a really good example of rewarding the negative on a track i don't know if you've seen him do that 
but basically when he's tracking, you know, if the dog loses track odor and pops his head up, Jay's rewarding that. Good, good. Tell me you're wrong. Tell me you don't know where it's at so we can start procedures to regain the track. But he's using that marker right there of good. Let well, me know. And that's important. A picture, a, for those that didn't catch that, like picture a dog that has only ever been corrected for coming off the track. Mm -hmm. If that dog's lost that track, you could go for a long ways while that dog's just like, ah, oh, crap, I'm not yep. coming off this track because I'm going to get corrected. Oh, you're just going to go for a ride on pick <laughs> direction. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you almost need the dog. It's okay mm -hmm. to lose the track. We're going to, we're going to come through it. We're going to figure it out together. But yeah, so it's just like, you know, can you get a, a, a dog to track something just by like correcting it by coming off the track? You know, yeah, yeah. but you might end up with that dog to where, you know, we talk about bird dogs being honest and not pointing, you know, non-productive stuff right there. Well, we don't want to reward that behavior. Well, we also don't want to want to reward that in a tracking dog that's taking it down an empty track. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, as we start kind of nearing the end on this, did you have anything else in regards to markers? No, I think that was it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to touch on tug. Because obviously your episode lit a fire with with a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of a people, a, a lot of people. <laughs> a ton. Thank you for the phone calls and emails. It is uh, it's a bit much in a good way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like always on the phone though. Uh, I, I mean the the response and just the amount of people clicking the link to go to the freaking buy the tug. I mean I have no idea how many tugs we sold that dude, uh, but. Yeah, he he should be happy. I want to know you have spent a lot of time messaging people and on the phone with people. I know because I've sent them your way, and you're like, man, this this is not stopping. Yeah. Uh, why do we think that it resonated with so many people? It got people excited. I have my theories, but I also want to know what are some of the common elements, frequently asked questions that you've kind of seen through all these phone calls that maybe we could touch on to help those other people that have been listening and maybe didn't reach out to ask. Yeah. I think the biggest reason people responded well to it and they, they want to do it is a common thing I hear in the bird dog world is the bond. It's always the bond, the bond. I want the bond. I, you know, I, I want a better bond with my dog. I'm, I'm worried about being gone because of losing the bond and things like that. And tug is an epic opportunity to bond and maintain that bond and build it even better. So I think that had something to do with it. Um, I don't know if that's the whole picture. Can I add some, yeah. as someone who was one of those people that got very excited about it, yeah. like, so the bond thing definitely, but also the thing that like super resonated with me was the discussion about like how we spend so much time that the bird is the reward and then they get the, re they get the reward, but they're not done yet. Like uh -huh. they're not finished. So mm -hmm. it was like, Oh, that makes so much more sense that, you get the reward after you finish the thing and you come back to me and I'm integral in that, that, which kind of speaks to the bond too, but I'm yeah. integral in that reward piece. It's not, you got rewarded by your own, like getting that bird. Like to me, that was the thing that was like, ah, nah, strictly for the retrieving portion of it, mm -hmm. of the, yeah, go get mechanism to play game with me. Mm -hmm. Reinforcement is here. So, um, yeah, I mean, that is true. I was doing remain by blinds the other day with my dog and, you know, put him by the blind, go, hide away fire my shots come back and pay him in position so he remained where he should be i'm going to then mark him and pay him with a tug right there and that reinforces value to that spot and you know we get our good fulfillment game in and reinforcement we have a good time um so that's another way i used it but i think uh the most commonly asked questions is how do i start what are the steps you know what what's the you know step one step two step 10 and it's been a little difficult on that side because there's it's a process it's not a step by step it, this is not force fetch this is something else so you just got to kind of read the dog and play his games and, and know you know if my dog's not super fired up on this what can i do to make him that way you know we have tools like our kennel that we can use to isolate some behavior and not allow him to go out there and get fulfillment on his own you want to you want to be fulfilled, you're going to come play the game with me and then we'll, we'll have fun, things like that. So um, I think the other thing was, you know, how do I start teaching the out, things like that, and, you know, talking through people through like a back tie scenario if they would need that. Um, 
e-collars for teaching the out and how to immediately mark and repay and, and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I think, um, uh, it resonated with me and I've been doing that with, uh, doing it with my three girls. And, and I think I told you, I think what resonated with me and some of my buddies that I've spoken to since the episode came out and they got to he- hear what you're alluding to is since we entered the bird dog world, there's so many things in the bird dog world, don't do this. Don't do that. That'll ruin your dog. Oh, that your dog's never going to hunt again. You know, stuff like that to where, and there's, there's some elements of truth to some of them. Right. But I think people got way carried away with never allow your dog to do this. Never allowed to do that. And I, and it's like me and one buddy, my buddy Jacob, we're talking like, I almost feel like I was gypped out yeah. of, <laughs> out of some some time and bonding with my dog that if if we really understood the concepts and the the theories behind everything it makes all the sense in the world and i feel like i lost time with my dogs having fun if for no other reason just a fun game between us that if done correctly and consistently enough doesn't show itself in the areas that i think a lot of people claim that it does in the bird dog space. And that's kind of what resonated with me the most is like, I get to have fun yeah. with my dogs. Yep. <laughs> Dude. I mean, uh, you know, I had a, a rough couple last weeks, you know, a, a really good friend of mine passed away. Um, guy I spent a lot of time overseas with, and I was having a bad day, you know, who, who wouldn't. And, uh, I scooped up a tug, I scooped up my dog and we went outside and, and had fun. And just, he was loving it, you know, and I just needed the the therapy session with my, with my dog, but he had a great time. And I think the other thing I'm catching on to with, with people's phone calls is they're trying to still keep it very flat and very obedience oriented and very dull. Like this is meant to be an exciting, fun game. Like this should be a lot of back and forth and, and having a good time and, and really getting into it. Just me and him, right? There are times where, you know, when I'm now asking for that poppy or show your obedience or whatever, pick your thing you're working on, but where I will get more flat and more reinforcement will come. But, you know, it should be a fun game. It's not meant to be dull and like, dog, tug with me. And the dog's like, no. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> if I've got to toss it and play with him and act like a, a little kid about it, then I'll do that. But it's, that's part of the fun also mm-hmm. is. I think I told you, like, I had, it it was weeks ago, but there was one day where you were like, well, how's the tug coming along? I'm like, man, last night, it was like, it was just one of those days in life that was like, all right, this is a stupid day. Like, you know, just not in the right headspace, Mm -hmm. but I needed to still go work the dogs, but I wasn't in the right headspace to really go do anything. And, you know, especially with Quinn being up on the table, I needed to do a table session. I'm like, you know what? just no like i'm not in the right mood this can only go one way and that's not the right way let me just get the tug out have some fun with them and all three dogs really engaged that evening and i texted him afterwards and i think i told you i was like dude this is just good medicine Uh (laughs) right for you and the dog i mean look at steadiness right with my dog when i was just letting letting him stand there and watch birds fall off we did the right thing I always want to pay my dog somehow. That bird flew off. We're not getting it. I walk up to him, mark him, pay him with a tug. And yeah. that was how he got rewarded for staying in position right there. So anybody listening to this that uh, wants to see some of this in action, go to Liberty Canine on Instagram. And they're going to see you've been doing some reels. I mean, yeah. ever since we did that episode, you're like, dude, this isn't – insane like how many people want to talk about tug i'm like dude lean into it man Mm -hmm. like you know you do have videos and of sessions of where you're just playing tug in the garage or whatever but you also have sessions out in the field doing full-on steadiness session twitch your utility test is is this weekend uh from what i've seen on steadiness i don't think that you're gonna have an issue Mm -hmm. and uh you know it's you used Back to what we're talking about, payment doesn't always have to be food in the field. 
a game of tug in the field. <laughs> that's that's pavement, right? Dead bird I just, toss. I just want to see the nav to judges' faces when, like, in the <laughs> in the middle of your test, you just pull out and do a tug. Like, oh, God, dude, <laughs> I, I will if they let me. No, I don't care. I'll, I'll whip that thing out right there. Like, Let's go swinging through the air. Yeah, shouting in Dutch at him. They're going to be like, who is this dude? But, I mean, that's what made steadiness. I'm not – I mean – steadiness wasn't hard it was not difficult to do because i had a powerful marker i had a lot of reinforcement history on an e-collar he understood how to get paid i was paying him a position i had other methods to pay the dog and reward him for his efforts if you have those things man it's, they if they're versed in that language i mean you can do a lot and it's not terribly difficult yeah so. you leave the bird dog world and I've, I have feel like it's safe to say that I've, I've left the bird dog world a, a, a fair amount with the trainers and people that I've had on and getting to see their dogs and how they interact. It's amazing at the, the caliber of dogs that I'm consistently finding from the people and the trainers that talk about the value and heaviness of play with these dogs. So anybody listening to this that is still maybe on the fence or questioning a tug or whatever, just go look outside of the bird dog world and how many trainers are effectively using play at, to create that addict in that dog to where you have that consistent value to where maybe you need that high level of reps that we were talking about earlier in a, in a given scenario. And you know what? The dog's just satiated or the dog's eaten. How many times have, have we wanted to go do a training session with our dogs? And it's like, Oh crap. Well, we already fed them. Well, they're, they're not going to be motivated like that. You know, this gives you another, another approach, another path. And, uh, you know, just that that's what I could go back to is so many people are producing some really cool dogs that do some really cool stuff with play as the reward. And I think that we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we continued in the bird dog world, discounting that and saying, Nope, it's going to create a hard mouth dog. When so many people have already proven that that's not the case when, when appropriately done. So, yeah. So, like, to that person that's on the fence, would you say, like, there's something, like, that's important to avoid, that like, a pitfall to, like, to, to not create all those problems that everyone was concerned about? Like, is there, like, hey, if you see this, like, you need to knock it off or, like, don't allow this to happen or whatever? Or is it just is it just kind of, like, a really a myth, you know, like? About the tugging turning into a hard mouth dog? Well, that or any of the other concerns that people have about playing with the dog and using mm -hmm. tug. Like, I mean, is there, is there something, like, hey, you know, you, it could be dangerous if you like, so avoid this or whatever. I mean, like, or is it just like a, yeah, hey, you know what? There's really not much to worry about. Like it's, you've just yeah. been lied to your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to tell you. Um, yeah. I mean, there's really not much that can go wrong with it, man. Uh, the hard mouth thing, in my opinion, I'm in just my opinion is genetics, right? I, that's what I think. Or you've got an older dog that's been allowed to do some really naughty things for a long time. But you or frustration, dogs dogs yeah. can start leaking through stuff like yeah. that to where they're just anxious or frustrated. Mm -hmm. But then we have other issues in other exactly. Places. It's, it's not, not it's issue. not from yeah, tug. It's not from tug. Um, if you're doing tug tug appropriately, man, it it should be fun. There should be boundaries. There should be some control to it, but they're pretty loose, right? Um, I mean, you see me, I literally pick my dog up off the ground and swing him around. Um, yeah. I'm not saying go put your dog on a on a bite, you know, just because you're tugging with him doesn't mean he's going to bite everything. And and also, I did have a couple people write in, and they weren't like poo pooing the entire idea, but they equated it to the same thing as squeaky toys. On these tugs, we aren't getting the reward of a squeak. Yeah, there's no squeak. <laughs> there's no squeak. So the don't... worst thing you get is a prey shake. You yeah, know? and I've I've had some rabbit retrieves where rabbit was still halfway alive, and you know we. He it needed a prey shake. And watching a little fifty pound poodle pointer prey shake the the hell out of a rabbit's pretty fun. So, but you know, that's about the worst that I think you could get is some prey shaking. But I have not had any of that with any of the dogs that I've touched or taught tug to and bird work. Like I've had none of that. Yeah. So, and it's been across the board: setters, poodle pointers, wire hairs. Yeah, I mean, 
I haven't had anything like Again, that. Again, it goes back to if anybody hasn't listened to it, you know, go go listen to the Ranger episode. I'll have the link in the show notes and, and he goes into this a little bit more and and again, we're gonna find a guest that really goes in deep on like why this oh, yeah. works. But at the end of the day, the dog learns that when the tug goes dead, that's when the release is coming. Mm-hmm. So Again, dead bird, there's no tug. Like It's just when there's feedback. So, again, anybody that's saying that this will create a hard mouth dog, that, you know, conceptually, they just haven't kept up with, with the information. I'll prove you wrong. I mean, I will. <laughs> I, I, will go, I will tug with my dog right in front of you, and then we can go shoot a bird, and he will retrieve it. And I mean, he's soft as can be. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, I enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, appreciate you guys coming on. Yeah.